seeing is believing, but the truth depends upon your point of view. Welcome to POV, a documentary series taking you to places you've never been before, introducing you to people you've never met before, and giving a voice to stories you've never heard before. Hello, I am Rashid Silvera. Today we're happy to bring you part two of our series on innovative leadership, strings and bows. D.B. Roderick, producer, director. It has been said leadership and innovation are an inseparable partnership, just like the strings and the bows of a violin are inseparable. Without their union, there is no music, and the same is true in business. We have a motto in our business, and it's four words. It's quality, perfection, integrity, and craftsmanship. Our story begins in 1943 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It is a cultural melting pot for Jewish and Italian immigrants and the Colstein family. Samuel Colstein is a young Brooklyn Polytech High graduate with an engineering background and a passion for music. He attends Juilliard School of Music, where he is mentored by Professor Frederick Zimmerman, a former New York Philharmonic bassist. Any successful businessman must have talent, vision, and tenacity to become a leader in business. Sometime later, Samuel exhibits those very qualities when he repaired a broken bow that other craftsmen claimed was unrepairable. Samuel Colstein's son, Barry, fondly recalls the story of the broken bow. He went around to some of the repair people in Manhattan at that point, and they looked at the bow and they said, this can't be repaired. He looked at it with his engineering background and said, why can't it be repaired? And he repaired it and he showed it to Fred Zimmerman. And maybe it was a couple of weeks later, he called my father up and he said, Sam, I have something I want you to pick up. And he had a, a Barzoni base that had been destroyed in an accident. It was literally in a bag. It was so badly destroyed. He said, I want to see what you can do with this. And my father didn't have a shop. He was working out of the kitchen of his apartment in Brooklyn. And it took him months and jury rigging tools and things like that, but it was a challenge. And he restored this instrument, restored it so well that Fred looked at it and basically said to him, you know, you're a great musician, but you're missing your calling. And he got involved with instrument repair. He was hired by uh, the famed Wurlitzer establishment in Manhattan. As a young child, my mother used to do the bookkeeping and she'd put me under her arm and I'd sit in the shop and uh, sit by his side and watch him work and uh, I was taken by it. I was, I mean, my teeth were cut on this business. Cut his teeth indeed. An accomplished bassist himself, Barry joined his father in 1971 and embarked on what was called a European apprenticeship. I found out very quickly. It was a very tough apprenticeship and being his son didn't mean anything at that point. You, know, you had to go from the bottom up, from sweeping floors to become a luthier or an instrument maker. You have to understand the instrument, you have to play it. It gives you all the knowledge of what the player is going through. The shop was open to all these great players and anybody that came into the shop uh, I kind of grabbed hold of and they were always happy to give me a lesson or coaching or listen to me play. So it was a great experience. Just as important as leadership is, so are relationships. They are critical to the success of any business. I consider myself really blessed, you know, going back, you know, to Tim Cobb, to Harvey S, to Rufus Reed. My relationship with uh, Colstein family has been tremendous over the years. Of course, there are other luthiers, and the ones that most people go to apprenticed in this shop over the years. So, I mean, they carried that same excellence. And so, to me, it was not only a, it's a place that's got history. I know that one over there is about 400 years old, an Italian instrument. 
belonging to Percy Heath. I mean, we, we like being here because we want to hear the stories. These are the stories that we all talk about. And uh, uh, each instrument has its own. Uh, this one, I wish you could talk. Barry and Sam would work together until the late 70s when they decided to expand the business. After they opened a new shop in Baldwin, New York, the baton of leadership would pass from father to son. I remember turning to my father and said, you know, Dad, where do you want your bow shop to go? And my father looked at me and says, I'm not coming. I want to make bows for the remainder of my career, but it's your turn to fly. Moving forward under Barry's leadership, Colstein was quickly becoming known for craftsmanship, restoring and building some of the world's finest stringed instruments played by the masters. I've had a great relationship with, with Barry and, uh, and the, the Colstein shop that, out there in, in Long Island. I had had other bases before, but uh, I got both of my bases here. One is a, is a, a Juzak, which is a, a Czechoslovakian base made about 100 years ago. And uh, it was owned by another bass player. And it, it was in an accident and pretty much really damaged very badly. So Barry rebuilt the whole thing. And, you know, it went from a okay, nice bass to a extraordinarily beautiful and amazing instrument because Barry put in all the best stuff and you know all his expertise went into it. Eventually the time would come for Barry to pass the baton of Colstein's leadership to its next leader, Manny Alvarez, whom he met under the most unusual circumstances. Uh, Manny came to me when he was 14 or 15 years old. He came in to buy his first good violin with his parents and uh, he happened to try a bunch of instruments and the one that he fell in love with is still the instrument he owns. It's a Colstein uh, violin that I had made. Could have been a couple of thousand dollars. It wasn't a high cost instrument but uh, but his parents just said you know this is not something at this point in time that we can afford. And uh, I, there's something about Manny I really liked, you know, and I kind of, I looked at him and I said, uh, you want a job. We are looking for someone to work in the back, in the, in the warehouse, um, um, pouring and packing rosin, sweeping the floors, or cleaning and organizing. Are you interested in something like that? And I said, I, I would love that opportunity. So I started working after school and on the weekends and the coal scenes so graciously allowed me to pay off the instrument over the two-year period. I always made sure to be thankful and enthusiastic for, for those opportunities where I got to learn and grow. I never got to meet Samuel Colstein. Uh, Samuel Colstein started the company in 1943, but unfortunately he passed away in 1999, so I never had a chance to meet him. The process of becoming the owner and president of the company was one that I feel happened organically. Uh, things were changing in my life. I got married and I had my first child and my mindset changed as to what my priorities were. In that moment, it was no longer that I was just thinking about myself, but thinking about my child and my family and, and, and my future. I was fortunate and unfortunate to take the company over um, about three months, two months before COVID. So this flipped the whole world upside down and specifically our industry. We were doing business with, with Broadway, with Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, traveling orchestras, and playing professionals. And now that COVID came, that all closed down. So I feel that during this period, there was a the perfect opportunity to pivot, transition, to start something new, 
and to and to think about our industry and the business differently because it was no longer business as usual. So some of the things that we did in response to what was happening with the global pandemic was to switch the focus from retail, from sales, to how can we help our community. What we started, the Coal Scenes Musicians Relief Fund. We wanted to put musicians back to work because we felt so bad that they no longer had a venue to perform at, nowhere to make uh, income, but also they couldn't express the music that was locked up inside of them. They didn't have an audience. Some of, uh, some of these performers were our clients, so we wanted to help them. So we opened a stage here in Long Island. We asked them to come and perform here every Friday night. the things that we take into account is not just to make a sale, but we want to make sure that we develop a relationship and that this is an ongoing relationship for, for years and years to come. So I think that those uh, tenants of our company really help uh, keep us grounded and focused in everything that we do. <laughs> You know, as I said, I grew up uh, with a bass player father, uh, and so uh, at that point, uh, Barry Colstein's father, Sam Colstein, was uh, running the business, and it was sort of a household name. Eventually, I found myself, you know, driving down to New York City to visit the mysterious Colstein <laughs> workshop. It was really interesting to, you know, finally see the shop and uh, beautiful bases. The Colstein name is. Uh, kind of huge in the bass world, you know. I mean, it's known the world over uh, easily. You know, a bass and a uh, bassist then is bass. It, it couldn't be um, more important in a way, more meaningful uh, and more <laughs> kind of elusive and frustrating at the same time. Um, I think string musicians are always, even the ones who feel really happy and, and, and let's say in love with their instrument, most professional, let's say, or accomplished string players dream of an old Italian instrument because the simple fact is that the Italians were the masters. And, uh, you know, some of those makers, as they say, they almost took their secrets to the grave. I mean, they, they, they're wonderful contemporary makers. I, I, I'm not saying that, but uh, there was something about these incredible old instruments. They just, they're on sort of like a higher plane. best at what he did and you know I was fortunate enough to study with him and and uh, you know this whole shop is built upon the premise of one set of hands so whether I do it whether Chris does it whether Rigo does it you know the end product is uh, is basically Colstein. We have a motto in our business and it's four words it's quality perfection integrity and craftsmanship and everything that we do we keep that in mind I hope you not only enjoyed this story, but I hope it provoked you to consider how innovation is born out of the vision of strong leadership. Stay curious, my friend. <laughs>